Um, okay, so uh, perhaps the uh, one of the, the the best lessons that we learned from the Aaron of Bohm effect and all the all the Aaron of Bohm type effects is that it's not the Lorentz force that matters for a dynamics of an object; it's the um, it's the interaction term in the Lagrangian. And it's only that when objects become macroscopic and um, we, we can't any longer observe the phase that uh, we, 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 we lose this information. So um, the interaction Lagrangian has information that may or may not relate to the fields uh, explicitly, locally. And um, so it's, it's, just, it's just that we lose that information in the macroscopic realm. So uh, the question is, if we can do interference experiments with um, big, with, uh, with, with relatively uh, large molecules, so, so now that we, we're um, thinking of things like buckyballs and more recently biomolecules, can we observe the Haranov Bohm effect? Does anything change or does anything stop us observing the Haranov Bohm effect in such, a, such an interference experiment? So these, um, these experiments are, are, well, they're very similar to the, the usual textbook double slit experiment. You, you, the, the original uh, experiment done in Vienna in, in about 10 years ago um, just consisted of a, an oven where you uh, resistively heated a powder of um, C60. Um, you, you make a slot in the side, collimate the beam, and then put it against the diffraction grating, let the, uh, the wave packet, well, the resulting um, superposition, evolve over about a meter, and then measure the position by um, using a laser. I mean, you, you just you, you, you uh, shine a laser across where the blue arrow is, and uh, you measure the ionization current resulting from that, um, which tells you where the, where the molecule is, because you're, if the laser is ionizing a, an electron from the, the molecule, then you, you can assume it's at that position. And when you do these experiments, you find that the, you've got uh, quite high co coherence. Well, you can make them quite coherent, so you can, you can observe a, a double split type interference pattern that's uh, got pretty high contrast. So. Um, what, first of all, what is it about this molecule that you're observing? Um, what wave-like properties? Clearly, it's not the internal atoms, because um, if you were trying to measure the location of an internal atom, um, it's coupled to all the others, and these things actually have quite high internal temperatures, uh, hundreds of Kelvin. So um, the internal atoms won't be coherent. They won't be in a separable state in that sort of representation. But if you um, think in terms of the center of mass, then... So long as your system is pretty translationally invariant, then your wave function must be in a product of center of mass and relative internal coordinates. So it's the, it's the translation symmetry of the experiment that means that you can observe the interference because the center of mass must be, if you like, statistically independent from the internal coordinates. So when, when, when they observe this interference pattern, what they're observing is the center of mass wave function modulus squared. So, I mean, well, let's say we wanted to uh, increase the contrast of this, this um, interference pattern. Um, what could we do? Well, um, there's several ways you could lose translational symmetry and therefore lose this separable state. There's thermal radiation between the environment and the internal states, and the interaction between the molecule and the walls of the apparatus, so maybe by the casimir polder interaction. And uh, stray fields, you know, maybe you haven't shielded a cable in your experiment, something like that. But all these things, you can, you can make them smaller. There's things you can do about them. However, there's one, this is sort of like my starting point, there's one, um, one thing about the experiment that removes the translational symmetry that uh, you can't get rid of. And that's the fact that you have to split the, the wave packet into two. Um, and this will necessarily couple the center of mass and the internal coordinates so that you're going to lose some contrast in your interference experiment. So a, a group in, um, in Bratislava studied this uh, a few years ago, and they considered quite a simple model. To, they, they wanted to find out what the loss of coherence was due to the, uh, the splitting of the wave packet. And their simple model was basically just um, two atoms rigidly coupled with a single internal degree of freedom, which is just an angular one. Um, and a center of mass motion, um, scattering off two slits. They're represented by just two Gaussian potentials. And then they worked out what the, using the Born, usual Born scattering, what the um, resulting uh, interference intensity was. Um, too good. 
Um, so the Hamiltonian was this quite simple form. So it's just the central mass kinetic energy, the internal energy, due to this angular degree of freedom, and the slits, which couple the two, because the slits act on the individual atoms, not on the central mass of the relative coordinate. So they found that, as you'd expect, you lose some coherence. So on the, on the right, this is where they, they um, don't include the internal degrees of freedom in their model, and on the left is where they do. And you can see that the contrast is reduced from, from right to left. Um, top to bottom is just different separations of the slits. So quite widely separated slits, you end up with more fringes. OK, so this is my thought now. Well, if, if there's something about the experiment that fundamentally means that the translational symmetry is lost, then you're going to lose coherence. There's going to be a fundamental limit on what you can, um, what you can measure. So, whoops, wrong way. So, so the Harron of Bohm effect is like this. The solenoid re removes the translation invariance because you have a vector potential that is now as immovable, and similar in the Harron of Kasher effect. So, what's the uh, what happens if you try to interfere a big molecule and observe in a Harron of Bohm type effect? Well, okay. So, which Harron of Bohm type effect? Well, we might ionize the molecule and then try and observe the interference around some enclosed flux, the usual one. It might have a magnetic moment, and we might uh, interfere it around a, a line of electric charge and try and observe the Aronov Kasher effect. There are the duals as well. So, I mean, one dual Aronov Bohm effect involves, they, both of them involve swapping electric and magnetic properties. I mean, the first one is where you have a magnetic charge around an electric flux, but that's not too, uh, too clever. I mean, uh, there's not many magnetic charges, certainly not in big molecules. But another one is where you swap the electric and magnetic properties in the Harron Kasher effect, and that's the Hema Keller Wilkins phase shift, um, which involves uh, an electric dipole in a magnetic field. And although this, this is sort of ideally a, a line of magnetic charge, really a, some approximately radial field would do. Um, so really, if I'm thinking about the interference of macromolecules and observing a Aaron of Bohm type effect, um, I'm thinking of these three. OK, so first of all, let's sort of look at a Aaron of Bohm type effect, or an Aaron of Bohm effect for some complicated molecule. Well, <clears throat> we'll think in terms of the propagator, so we'll look at what the form of the action is going to be. And you know, this is just a shorthand for summing over all the paths in the argument of this action. And if we find that the Lagrangian for this system in the Harron of Bohm effect breaks into some of two pieces, then we know that it, it will evolve from product state to product state. So we'll keep, keep coherence. So the center of mass will remain coherent as long as it isn't coupled to the internal degrees of freedom. So the full Lagrangian for this thing, non-relativistic, would be just the kinetic energy for the atoms, um, the Harron of Bohm interaction, and some internal Lagrangian that is holding the whole thing together. So if we, uh, if we expand that around the center of mass, because we're interested in the coherence of the center of mass, then it breaks into a few pieces. We have the center of mass kinetic energy. We have um, internal energy uh, the, and the internal binding. And what looks like um, some kind of coupling between the center of mass and the internal coordinates via the vector potential, even though it's without curl. However, this isn't quite true, because when we expand the vector potential around the center of mass, the Lagrangian takes this form. So it ends up being uh, what you'd have for a free particle of charge Q um, in the center of mass, Harron of Bohm phase. An internal Lagrangian, which is just the internal kinetic energy and the Lagrangian binding the whole thing together. And all of the interaction is locked up in a total time derivative containing this thing p hat, which is it's just in general it's the dipole moment, but you know it contains all the quadrupole moments and everything else. So you find that although the Harron of Bohm effect has broken the spatial symmetry of the uh, of the experiment, it's actually not important because all of it is locked up in a total time derivative in the Lagrangian, which you can always knock out. So there's no fundamental limit introduced by the Harron of Bohm effect. However, if you um, think about the Harron of Kasher effect, then the Lagrangian contains uh, a coupling with the magnetic moment. 
and we won't be able to remove that. So that contains the internal variables, and it's coupled to the center of mass through the electric field. Okay, so there's some limit introduced by that, because we've coupled the center of mass and the internal variables just by doing the experiment. And we the same thing in the hemocala wilkins effect, because the, the electric dipole moment is sitting in the Lagrangian, and that contains all of the internal variables. So again, there's, there's some limit in that effect. We're, we're going to lose coherence just by trying to observe an Harrow bohm type effect, either Harrow Kasher or Hemokala Wilkins, with a big molecule. We're going to couple the internal degrees of freedom in the center of mass, but not in the Harrow bohm effect. Okay, so let's try and get an estimate for what sort of, um, what sort of numbers we're talking about here. We'll take a, a model system and we'll take an electric dipole that's just a spring. Um, with some equilibrium extension A and some fluctuation X. And uh, we'll let it travel around the two directions on the ring and look at what the interference is on the other side. Okay, so along the track, we, we take the magnetic field to be radial. Um, so this is um, or at least approximately radial. So we're talking about the hemokala wilkins effect here. Really, um, it could be the haranoff kasher as well. I mean, we could have just made this a some harmonic response of a, a magnetic dipole and had a radial electric field. Okay, so we take this model Lagrangian, which is our interaction term. Uh, the, internal, the internal dynamics are uh, the relative coordinate uh, x, and it's uh, bound harmonically, so it's got a harmonic oscillator term, and we have the uh, center of mass kinetic energy. Okay, so d is just the x. So you can see the coupling straight away between the center of mass and the internal degrees of freedom in this experiment. So now we want to work out the action because, okay, so first of all, in path integrals, there's a theorem that says if the Lagrangian is quadratic in the canonical variables, so, you know, the r dots, x dots, x's and r's, then all that matters in the path integral is the classical path. So we just need to work out the classical action for this thing, and then we'll know what the coupling is in the phase, and then we can work out the dephasing of the center of mass within this uh, phenomenon. Okay, so that takes a little bit of work, but it comes out with this, this answer. So I've defined alpha as uh, R is the radius of the ring, B is the magnitude of this radial magnetic field, E being the, the charge of the two particles, um, theta being the coordinate on the ring, and omega, the frequency of the harmonic degree of freedom. Um, so part of the action is just related to the simple harmonic oscillator evolution. So that's just the propagator for free evolution of the harmonic oscillator. The next part is just what you'd have if the, uh, if the uh, dipole didn't move at all. So it's the uh, usual Haranov bohm phase. But, um, um, but for the equilibrium value of the dipole. And then um, we have uh, this term here, which um, you can see it involves the coupling between theta, the center of mass, angle, and the internal coordinates yeah, with a, some prefactors. Um, so it's, it's the, the cross term in this square that's doing all the work in the coupling. So um, if we try and then work out the propagation of a wave packet on this ring, we end up with an interference pattern that's reduced in contrast. So we're losing coherence. Um, and it's reduced by this factor chi, which is a an oscillating, uh, an oscillating factor. So we can see this is which way information. So by the manipulation of the internal state by the field, we're losing coherence because we could tell by inv investigating the internal state uh, which way around the ring the particle had gone. Um, and, but this, this sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. So this is why this is, this is oscillating, because sometimes we can tell which way it went, sometimes we can't, so the coherence oscillates. It decays. So for short time periods, this, so that's just a few oscillations of the uh, internal degree of freedom, so that's not very long at all. Um, chi takes this value here, which for typical numbers, we've got sort of a uh, magnetic field of, say, a Tesla, radius of this ring is a meter, just like in the original experiment, omega is about 10 to the 12, and the mass 10 to the minus 27. This thing's like 10 to the 11, so it's, it's a big loss of coherence for very, very short time periods. But it decays as one over n the number of oscillations. 
So by the time we've got to about 10 to the 6 oscillations, this thing's decayed away. So that if omega is 10 to the 12, this is 10 to the minus 6 seconds. But then if we say there's, that we've got a big molecule, this is lots and lots of these internal degrees of freedom. So this is going to be roughly proportional to the number of vibrational degrees of freedom in the whole molecule. So if we say that's about 100, then this, this thing decaying to 10 to the minus sort of lasts about 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Well, the extra power of 2 is going to be about 10 to the minus 4 seconds. Um, the experiment is usually, uh, usually we're done with uh, molecules that are going hundreds of meters a second. So the, the experiments last about 10 to the minus 2 of a second. So it's a hundredth of the, uh, of the experimental time. So if we're a bit more ambitious and said that we were either dealing with a very strong magnetic field, about 10 tesla, or a very weakly bound system, omega about 10 to the 10, then this extra power would mean that uh, doing experiments now of exactly the same form, but it, trying to do an Haranov Kasha or, Har or Hema Keller Wilkins type experiment, would mean that this coherence would be significant over the time. So that's the conclusion. So uh, the Haranov Ohm effect and its dual are distinct in the case of composite objects. Uh, in principle, um, there's nothing within the Haranov Ohm effect that limits the size of the object that can display it. And, uh, the flip, but in the case of the Haranov Kasha and Hema Keller Wilkins effects, the, the fluctuations of the dipole moment mean that the coherence is lost. That's, that's the end. So it averages to zero, is what you're saying? Can you imagine yeah. That moment is not zero, but I don't know how effect is up. So it is the same effect as this destruction of the dark moment, but or it's something more complicated. Um, so you you're saying? Mean. Do you mean that if the dipole moment, the actual value of the dipole moment, averaged? Of course, the equation suppresses the dipole moment itself. Yeah. So that. It's the same effect. But that would that would um, that would suppress the phase shift, but not the coherence. So the fluctuation of the dipole moment itself would mean that the, the Hema Keller Wilkins effect averaged to zero because the phase shift would be gone. But I'm saying that the, the fluctuations in the dipole moment actually um, cause a loss of coherence in the center of mass, so the redu reduction in the contrast, not the reduction in the phase shift. Okay. So it is, it is different. It is different. Right, let's take our speakers again.